obviously when you're a digital nomad you you can choose wherever you want to go obviously you choose good places that are appealing for you that you want to explore or that they are so amazing or they are like in paradise and being in that context and having to work at the same time as you are there it's it's, it's very tricky Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you guys are having a great start to your week. My name is Tom Froze. I'm an illustrator and designer in Vancouver, British Columbia. And this is the Making Friends vidcast. This is where I answer your questions about illustration. So normally in this show, I answer your questions about illustration. And for those of you who have asked me questions in the last few days and weeks, thank you very much. I have them all listed there, ready to answer. But today is kind of a special episode because instead of you picking my brain, I pick a fellow illustrator's brain about questions that I have. So one thing you may or may not know, because I probably haven't talked about it a lot, is that I often fantasize about traveling and illustrating at the same time. But of course, being portable and doing good work and having the right gear and all that is a bit of a puzzle for me. Like, how would I do what I do? Because I I do use a lot of physical media and, um, you know, I I enjoy having a lot of space when I work. But um, the illustrator that I I talked to, his name is Magos, and I'm going to give him a formal introduction in a second. He, He has kind of perfected the art of traveling and creating good work. So this was my first time creating a kind of conversational me plus someone else talking over Skype for video and recording it. So, you know, my my setup's pretty pretty rudimentary. We're just talking on Skype. I have a pretty sketchy internet connection. So it is a bit patchy, but the content is there and the conversation was, amazing. I just really enjoyed talking to Magos and I feel like he shared, he's just like a wealth of information. So let's talk about Magos. Magos is a Spanish illustrator from Spain, but he is a digital nomad. So he travels around the world while working. And his illustration, if you've never heard of him before, you've probably seen his work. He's a conceptual illustrator and very minimal in his style instantly recognizable. He's worked for clients like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Scientific American, among others. He has tons and tons of awards. What I like about his work is that his style is so instantly instantly recognizable. He's able to uh, capture complex ideas in very simple, easy to understand images. He's a master of visual rhetoric. And he's also He's very generous with his knowledge. He has, over the last few years, consistently kept a very helpful blog where he he shows you tips, not just about how to use certain illustration tools, but also how to conduct your business and how to stay in touch with clients and stuff like that. He also more recently launched a web resource called Illustration Tools. And he is actually going to talk about that in the course of our conversation. And so I'm going to link all the things that he's created, all these generous resources in the show notes. So another thing about this conversation we had is that it was um, long. We talked for about 90 minutes. And of course, I like I try to keep this under an hour if possible. And so I couldn't edit it back because I thought there was just too much good content. So we're actually going to break this episode up into two parts. So today will be part one and next week will be part two. Part one, we really just get to know Magos and, you know, it's an introduction to him. And we, we dip in a little bit into the digital nomad element. And then in part two, we really go deep into the, the idea of working and traveling. And he's just got so many amazing, helpful tips and experiences to share. And Magos, thank you so much for talking with me. It is an honor that that you made the time. You're a classy guy, just so willing to share, and I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your patience through all the, the sort of technical glitches. So again, yeah, 
This is my first time doing this and definitely some rookie actions going on here and you'll, you'll see them as you go along. Hopefully they'll just be part of the experience and part of our journey together as I'm learning how to do this kind of vidcast thing that I'm doing. Anyway, I'm really excited to share with you guys this interview, so let's just jump right into it. So starting at the beginning, really, like how, what's your story? Like, how did you become an illustrator? This story, I think, starts when, uh, around that time with the graffiti, when I was in, I don't know, I was 14, 15, and I was always interested in drawing, but eventually I became interested in painting graffiti, basically, uh, spray cans and all this stuff. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I made kind of a, my life was, for me at that time, graffiti was very, very important. I started painting and I started painting and traveling and just going to exhibitions as well. And I don't know, around when I was 19 or 20, I was even making, you know, kind of a living from that. From really? that. But then, yeah, but then I started to like getting tired. This is something that happens to me that I, I become very, very interested in things. And I go like, I push even to the limit that I invest many hours a day and near until I perfect or I, I'm happy with my abilities. Yeah. And then I just lose interest. Yeah. I, I just like, okay, it's done. I get that. Uh, it doesn't happen like that, but it's, it's yeah, it, it's kind of the result of that. Okay. So um, what happened is that then I switched to uh, Miro painting, which obviously painting graffiti was very, just like a short step. And mm -hmm. I was just doing murals and for clients and private clients and also for uh, institutions and city councils. I, it was fine. But then again, happened the same and I lost the interest. And I, I ended up um, in the illustration and realizing that, oh, now I can do the same. I can use digital tools. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be outside when it rains. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to, you know, back then I had a van and I uh, was a pain to put all the colors and calculate everything and make sure that you don't run out of any color and mm -hmm. you know suddenly it was oh wow it's i can do everything now right uh, unlimited and, and then I, I became interested on on illustration okay but then yeah yeah then then there's a lot of more processes until i reached that but that's i think that's how everything started really um within that before after during was there any um art school or formal education? I went to, a, I don't know how it is in English, but it's kind of like a course that, uh, two years course, it's kind of like a, a professional uh, education where, I don't know, people, it's the same level up if someone wants to work with wood or with uh, electricity or, you know, this kind of a like- trade school. Not going to the university. Sorry? A trade school, kind of. Uh, yeah, I, I guess. I, I, I'm not familiar with the name, but okay. it must be something like that. Okay. And yeah, I went there for, for a couple of years. It was a illustration course, and I learned a lot of things related to techniques. It, I think, at least in Spain, education sometimes is very confused. I, I, now, looking back, that course was more about drawing, about trying techniques. I, I have a lot of memories trying many things, even like digital, but also watercolors, oil, and many others. But I didn't get any really base of the real world of an illustrator. So right. that at the end, I, at the end of those two years, I, I didn't even really knew how to an illustrator an illustrator could make a living. So yeah, that that was the formal education I had. I I don't think that this was the real school. <laughs> okay, when was that? This was um, when I was, uh, when was that? This was 10 years ago, okay. something like that. Okay. <clears throat> maybe, maybe because now I'm 29. Yeah, like 10 years ago, something like that. And when I finished, maybe it might be nine years ago. Okay. But you've never felt, you never felt like um, you needed to go to art school, clearly. Um, looks like you're doing just fine without like having... Um, sort of that classical art education or anything like that? Mm, the thing is, I, I'm always, 
I'm all, I've, I've always been a self-taught and yeah. I really like figuring out by myself, uh, figuring out things by myself. And the idea of going five years somewhere to learn a bunch of things that I don't need, I've, I've never been into that. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, I mean, it, I love, I love how illustrations kind of a wild west. You don't need a, a specific degree to do it well. And I think designs like that as well. Um, it's not like law or engineering where you you know you you learn this very specific skill set and and then you kind of have to get certified every year you know and i think yeah i think you really do get to forge your own uh education and career path and uh so i think it's it's important uh to yeah to acknowledge that so i think that's great personally i needed to go to art school like i had to uh, because that's, I, I was kind of self-taught as well. I'm a, I'm a huge self teacher and very much about, you know, um, figuring things out myself. But I, I also, for me, I felt like there was that point where I had no influences that were, that I felt were like mentors to me or even peers. Like mm -hmm. I just kind of felt like yeah. really alone. So I, I kind of realized that if I went to art school, uh, I would at least be among people learning kind of at the same time and we'd be kind of a community of of uh people trying to figure it out together so that that worked out for me and it was good yeah so you went there for four years you know i i did it was a four-year degree but i did it in three years because i had previous education oh. so I, I applied credits okay. and stuff like that so i have okay. a very much like you are so lucky to have kind of figured out art as a career early mm -hmm. on like 19 for me is like super early like when I was 19 I was actually like putting art away and thinking this is this is going to take me nowhere and it wasn't until I was 26 that I went to art school so mm -hmm. um yeah so for so. you uh going to art school was a really like a turning point then yeah it was like coming back home for me really and um mm -hmm. it was it was also a big um a big step for me to like I, I had things kind of established where I was and I was living in Toronto at the time but I kind of felt like everything I had was kind of just I fell into I didn't have a lot of um, I didn't direct that situation and make it happen and I and I wanted to be more specific and deliberate about how I planned my my life I and see. and so by picking an art school outside of my city moving away from everything I'd known all my life. Uh, for me, that was like becoming an adult, you know, going away and, and finally yeah, doing something understand. deliberate and hard. And, and so obviously, you know, a lot about doing those kinds of things through your travels. Uh, one, one, one special point about that is that I, well, that you are very like, you know, right about this, that being self-taught is difficult. It's just like you're alone and, and you have to do everything by yourself. But mm -hmm. it's sometimes, yeah, the going to formal education or be part of a group, this is something that sometimes is even better than the education that you get from, from a place. Mm -hmm. it, you, you're in contact finally after this kind of like being alone and, and ignoring, having a lot of questions. Suddenly you're part of something. And I think... This is some, sometimes people don't put as much value as it deserves. This fact of, of being part of something, that's, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I feel like that, again, I have, um, I have kind of a, a question directed about, specifically about that, but I imagine that sense of connection and being part of something when you're traveling and on your own all the time, sort of. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that that definitely impacts that experience for you. I feel like the travel aspect is just kind of like as I was kind of researching you a little bit and preparing for this, mm -hmm. I was uh, I was realizing like the travel part for you is obviously a huge part for you, but it's almost incidental because you create like the work you do and the resources you create, like illustration tools and your blog and your newsletters. Like I, f I feel like that's your identity. You're, the fact that you travel is just kind of mm -hmm. like something interesting about you right yeah. and so i almost felt like man i just want to talk about your work and about the way you share and, and reach out so i, I do want to just before we get into the digital nomad stuff 
um, talk mm-hmm. a little bit about just um, more your 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 practice as an illustrator and and the, and sure. and sharing your resources um, with people. So, uh, quick bit of I guess way going back. I I think I must have encountered your work first in it might have been 2013. Uh, or thereabouts. It might have even been earlier. I, I, I'm sure it was your um, bib, biblio or something. Oh, bi- biombo. That's it. Um, you. Oh cre- yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. You created yeah. this booklet and it was beautiful. Uh, and and I, I'm sure that was the first piece I saw and was on a blog. And um, and anyway, I think I just started following you and then and found your newsletter. Um, mm-hmm. I can't even remember, but it's going back. But uh, I was amazed from the from that early time about how much you reached out to people created and shared shared resources for people like your process and documenting how to take spreadsheets for keeping in touch with clients and stuff like that stuff that like um I feel like I've been naturally kind of that's a little bit how my mind works uh uh like at least I'm very um, systematic, like I like to have systems and, and mm-hmm. things like that, and and calendars and spreadsheets and stuff like that. But I feel like you've been really good at making these and um, consistently sharing them with people, which is a whole other layer of commitment. And and what is it about in your blog posts and your you know even the way you answer your your comments so so. Um, so faithfully and right away, right? Like when someone like me comments on it, you get back to them right away. And I find that really inspiring. You seem to have a very good engagement with your audience. So what drives you to share all this content, like create it and share it? I think the, uh, the main thing is that as being self-taught, almost everything I know comes from others mm-hmm. in the internet, especially because I, I, um, yeah, I mean, this generation, when when I was a kid, the internet was starting at least as a mass product that, you know, you could have internet at your at home and, mm-hmm. and all these. And I think that changed my life in, in terms of, like, suddenly I have, I had um, access to vast amounts of, of information about topics that I, I didn't know anything about. And... I don't know that that really changed my life. And since then, every day, for example, today I now I'm very into programming and um, other non-related uh, stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, from illustration, and I, I'm able to learn and I'm able to grow because there are people doing that. And then mm-hmm. I said, okay, I'm I'm a mass, I'm I'm building this for myself. All these because I need to. I need to learn how to deal with clients. I, I need to deal know how to deal with, with everything. So why should I keep it for myself? If, mm. you know, if, if I, and then I saw myself in the other side of saying, oh, I have this information. What do I lose or what do I, you know, uh, stop having if I put it out there? Yeah. And I, I, I do that as, as, as much as you can, be, uh, as much as I can, but there are many other things. I mean, uh, I, uh, as I said, Previously, I, I have many things that I'm, I'm, I don't make public because, I don't know, first, maybe they are not as useful or maybe I'm so, uh, uh, I don't know, focused or um, uh, obsessed with organization or things like that, that maybe are not going to be interesting. The ones that I consider that they must be useful for others, I just don't, I don't have any problem sharing them. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's amazing. Do, do you think that... Um... There's a relationship between you being out working alone, either just as a freelancer or, or even just far away from your home, uh, mm-hmm. that sharing and building a community around your resources is a way of, of uh, feeling in touch with others or being a part of the community? Maybe, yes, maybe. Because I've always been this, you know, this friend that everyone has that has a when you have a problem with a computer or you have a problem with a phone, right? You, you call them. So well, you're I'm the guy. Person, and I've always been like that. And, and you know, previously, before even having a blog, I I wrote all those things by email to friends that they say, right. "Hey, how can I connect this to this other? Or right. What's the best way to get a domain and connect it to that? You know, this is what 
what this is very interesting for me that this I do that for as a hobby as well so yeah I was doing that before and I, and yeah it's a way of connecting also the, the fact that it's not that I'm far from home is that for many years I never had I, I haven't had a, a home so the concept for home for me is is I don't know uh, abstract mm -hmm. and yeah being connected in the internet by sharing I think that's a good definition yeah hmm. that's very good yeah I like that yeah no I definitely relate to um being asked a lot of technical or questions just about how to do stuff and that's actually why why I started this this YouTube channel is because yeah. people want to pick my brain all the time and uh I I'm definitely uh this like the same I I love sharing my experiences with people because um all the people that shared with me and I feel like there's that responsibility, if you will, to, to you know, yeah. it's, it's not just a responsibility, it just feels, it feels right, you know, and, and so to, to pass that on and, and, and obviously there's people who you email and ask questions and they don't answer you and you're like, I was just asking a question, you could have at least said no thanks or something like that, right? So yeah. the idea that like I should always acknowledge people who are asking me for help, I, I, I do take that seriously, but the busier I get, uh, and I have a family, I have two kids, you know, uh, I just, it, there, I finally, I think in 2017, 2018, uh, this has been the point at which like, it's been actually hard to actually follow through with my, um, my ideal scenario of being able to respond to every email. And so yeah. I thought, yeah, let's, it's time to make a resource online for people to, to learn about what I do in a most in the most helpful way. So that's I I totally relate to that. Yeah, I love that you are doing that because there is a thing. Uh, there is a, a personal thought about this, but I think our profession is weird in terms of like it's art, but it's art that most most of the times is subjected to commercial. So it's kind of like artist, but at the same time someone who does assignments. And then it's not like graphic design, just, I don't know, like user interface where, mm -hmm. when you use tools. Illustration is about, I don't know, your own voice, your own way of seeing the world. So mm -hmm. there is also part of ego there. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. For me, illustration is very weird because it's, it's a mix of many things. And I think that that's what makes illustrators more like... Um, uh, uh, people that appreciate solitude and there are no big industry on that. It's like, I don't know, like everyone goes on a bit on, on their own and, you know, it's, I don't know, it's all these components make me think that that's why graphic design industry is massive compared to illustration and the resource available there, not only tools, but everything like media, like a podcast, everything is, you know, it's, I don't know, 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is something I've been, I've been thinking since, since I, I've been an illustrator. Always has right. been very difficult for me to, to, to find those things online. And, oh, definitely. Or even offline. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly it. I mean, really, we're just artists thinly veiled as commercial um, designers or something like that. And and at the end of the day, it really is um, comp compared to being a designer, because I've been both. I am both. I'm a designer and an illustrator trained as a designer. Um, you really are an artist and, and it is about your style uh, and how your style comes through, whether it's conceptual or more literal and representational versus abstract. And, and then like the personality you bring that. So you can't teach all of those things, right? You can't teach someone um how to be a particular style you can talk about it you can try and imitate it you can um but but really it is a there is an element where finding yourself as an illustrator is really a journey and you have to um it's up to you to figure out when you've arrived at whatever it is you're going to like for me i feel like i'm actually always reframing what my goal is as an illustrator what my style should do what what um what i want to accomplish what kind of um, voice I have and and so yeah definitely having tools that help at least tell you like someone else has been there before or or um, 
you know, what you're doing is, is working or not working. Those, those kinds of resources are super helpful for illustrators. So I think that's awesome. Yeah. So you do a lot of work. Uh, it looks like you're um, constantly making images and also like, at least when you're traveling, it seems like you're still doing that. So for me, I, Oh, the other thing is that I would say, I, like, just by observation, is that your your work is um, you do a lot of editorial, so you're working a lot with magazines. Is hmm. that is that safe to say? I started working on editorial, but nowadays I think uh, has changed, and I think I work more on advertising. And, okay. Uh, okay. But yeah, editorial as well. Maybe now I'm in uh, like forty percent editorial, sixty percent, because when animation last. We can right. talk about that later if you want. But yeah. when I started doing animations, that also opened an, many doors. And, and okay. yeah, now I'm, yeah. Are you, yeah. Doing, are you doing a lot more motion now? Yeah, a lot. Like, um, I don't know, like 70% uh, of everything I do is animation. Right. And most of them, well, I, I, that's another thing that I don't post. I post maybe like 30% of what I do because yeah. I, I want to, keep everything like filtered <laughs> yeah but, of um, course you curate yourself pretty yeah, tightly I do a lot. Uh, yeah it, animation is is the next thing okay as when i don't know i was painting graffiti and then i started doing murals and then right. illustration animation it doesn't mean that i'm tired of illustration but it's something that just appeared and opened a completely new language right uh, this is the new summit so yeah yeah so um I guess what I, well, I guess part of my question was based on like my, my perception that you did a lot of editorial, but we all know that editorial doesn't pay amazing fees. Like you can't, I don't think you can yeah. sustain yourself as an illustrator doing only editorial because even, even like big, the big ones like New York times, like you're not, mm -hmm. you know, per illustration per, for the amount yeah. of time you spend on those, you know, it's, it's not nothing compared to, um, advertising and retail and, and packaging and stuff like that so i think you can sustain i sustain myself doing entirely editorial but i think it's about obviously the quality of works that, that you did and obviously uh um how how many uh, every month uh, i think actually it's possible to to, to live on editorial but right. it's, it's obviously if, if compared with advertising it's a different world yeah uh, in everything, in timings, in budget, everything. Yeah, but do you, so I imagine that you you would have to work quite fast to make a living as an editorial, like if yeah. editorial is your yeah. only thing. I'm, I'm admittedly, admittedly quite slow, like I take a lot of time in the process to think yeah. about it and uh, arrive at an idea and then and then I spend at least half or more of my time doing that. And so I wondered, like, is, do you feel like, like, how long does it take you, uh, let's just say, for a, a typical spot illustration? Like, do you spend, do you get a day? Do you do two days? Do you do a week? It's difficult to say because yeah. it's just like, a, it's a quest that, well, you probably know. It, it's just, you start, like, um, pulling a string and pulling and pulling and working and around topics and eventually you find something and maybe that something doesn't work and then you need to take another path and it's difficult. But sometimes I find ideas in just a matter of like minutes, even like mm -hmm. 30 minutes. But other times it's just, especially when the topics become more like, I don't know, there are topics that are complicated, not because the topic itself is complicated, but you know, for example, politics and, all the things like that, I don't even take them anymore because I don't think there is a space for doing something that is worth it. Hmm. And I, that's also another aspect or another um, component of this formula to, to see. But yeah, editorial is, is fast. And what I do is I, I keep a um, notebook. Well, nowadays is, is the iPad and I, I use Procreate and I yeah. have my, uh, I have a notebook there and I just, use it as a sketchbook basically right and i have many ideas that um for some for one reason or another it, those I ideas are not um 
getting completed on one assignment. Okay. So then I, I kind of like uh, organize them somehow and, and then I always have something there. Right. And sometimes when I got an assignment, I already know <laughs> which of those nice. I can just kind of free because they are kind of in a waiting there. And Yeah. So you have your own little library of, of like stock yeah. that you use. Especially with uh, conceptual illustration, because I've been doing that exclusively, which means that there is always, I'm always looking for the idea and the idea needs to be like, there are some rules and there mm -hmm. are some, yeah, well, everyone has their own <laughs> mindset on that, but yeah. And, and there are many of those that are there and, I enjoy doing that, and sometimes it's very pleased. I'm I'm very pleased when I finally found this, uh, like a way out of that idea. Like, oh, finally! And right. that happens all the time. Nowadays, I have like, I'm not sure if hundreds, but a lot of them. I mean, I I could make something from just out of of those yeah uh, sketches. So ready? They're yeah. almost just like take it out of the freezer and put it in the oven and it's ready to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. That's yeah. I, I, uh, I'm very envious because I, I just, and this is just how, how different we as illustrators can be. Like I, I just can't do a new illustration based on old work. And so like there's a, occasionally times when I sneak something in that I've used before. Like I, I reuse textures, you know, stylistic elements, um, and sometimes, you know, one idea informs another, but I, I don't think I've ever been able to just take a half-baked illustration and turn it into something yeah. for the next job. And so um, this is probably why I'm wondering about, like, you know, how do you do editorial or, or even as much as work as you do, whether ad advertising or whatever, traveling, um, there must be some efficiencies that you're able to uh, do, pick up on while you're doing that. Because um, for me, I spend, like I said, 50, 60, sometimes more percent of a project just thinking about how to do that. And you you might notice, like, compared to your images, which are conceptual and very specific to the article, but very universal, you could see that being used for something else. Um, mine are always just like, I feel like almost too tied to that specific context. Um, yeah, tailored is specifically exactly. for that piece. And so that's my weakness, but I guess, you know, it can be uh, also a strength, like where it's, it's very special to the client, but... Yeah, I don't um, think it's a weakness. I think it's just how it is. Yeah. It's, it's, very, it's great. I mean, you create and you spend so much time on one piece because it needs to be... Yeah, it has some rules that make them um, super special. So I, I mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, no, but I think... I think it's um, definitely helps helps you stay afloat and not burn out if you're able to um, recycle and reuse some of the mm. intellectual efforts that you've you've made previously. So I think I think that's really good, and it's also obviously a clue in, as to like perhaps how you're um, able to to uh, do what you do, uh, stay mobile and, and keep going. And mm -hmm. again, like I. I I uh, read through a lot of your, like I read through your Digital Nomad series on your blog mm -hmm. and so I'm like, oh, this is all the stuff I want to know anyway. Why am I interviewing about it? But <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, but I think, I think within that, like I can see that you've minimalized your, your, your toolkit and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like what's, what's your setup look like right now in terms of um, being mobile? Right now, I, I, I uh... I have an iPad Pro that mm -hmm. I use for sketching, mm -hmm. and there is where it, everything happens. I mean, uh, the idea of uh, search or quest or or whatever happens mm -hmm. there. And normally they are just very like rough sketches, like just lines and you know playing with concepts and and recently I started to use color and stuff, but. Um, this is something that I haven't showed because I'm just building things on, as yeah. I mentioned before, I, I love the idea of working in the shadows and just developing things. And, yeah. you know, I like the idea of, uh, when, it, uh, while everyone sleeps, <laughs> I was, I wake up very early <laughs> and I do my things. And, yeah. and this is kind of, it's not, a, it's not a secret that I'm baking something and, right. and, and, and I, 
I do a lot of things like that. And for example, now I use a lot of the iPad Pro uh, to um, uh, to create. They are not finals or anything. Just exploration of mm. new ma- mains of like uh, um, communication. But yeah, the iPad Pro is gaining a lot of of, of weight on my setup. Mm-hmm. But then I use a uh, I do I use Illustrator and I just uh, do everything in vector nowadays uh, mm-hmm. because the animations basically. Right. Before yeah. Before I was working with Photoshop, but uh, at some point it was totally impractical for for the reason that it took like three or four times. Uh, uh, yeah, the resources, the time, and everything. Yeah. No, I I hear you there. So I'm a I'm a Photoshop Illustrator. And I need to be just because of the the raster elements and yeah, the textures and stuff. But I was super excited when uh, you first shared like how, your Photoshop flow, and I was like, "Oh yes, oh, a yeah. Photoshop <laughs> Illustrator, great!" And, like I don't, I don't really like. I've never considered myself like a, a software loyal person. Like I, you know, it's not about software. It's about like your um, how you think and 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 you know your creativity and yeah. ingenuity, regardless totally. of of your tool but of course I've worked a lot in Illustrator um, I'm very pr- proficient in all, all the creative suite but I mm-hmm. I just found that based on how I work Photoshop just works better so I was like oh there's someone who gets it they're Photoshop they, they they're not using <laughs> yeah. Illustrator which seems like I felt a little bit like a rebel using Photoshop yeah. uh, for the kind of because I do have a lot of pen tool and vector and paths in my work mm-hmm. And people always ask me, like, I have a Skillshare class called Inky Illustrations, and there's another yeah. one called Inky Maps. And people are always asking me, can I just use Illustrator for the for the vectors? And and I'm always I always try to encourage them to work in Photoshop because I, I, there are specific reasons why. But anyway, um, I was excited that you were uh, a Photoshop Illustrator, and then you switched yeah. over to Illustrate Illustrator, and I'm like, oh no, now I have to like. Maybe I, I have to go back to Illustrator and I was, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that, but <laughs> I was like. But do you, do you use a, like a Cintiq or an iPad Pro? What do you use? Um, okay, so I've, uh, up until very recently, I've been just a, a mouse. Uh, oh. Like I, 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 do every, I do all my sketches pencil on printer paper, really basic. Yeah. Um, and then I use the pen tool with mouse and I do all my textures um, physically with analog. But uh, about two years ago, three years ago, I got a Wacom into OS 4, mm-hmm. just an older okay. tablet. And I, it was a love-hate with it. I'd use it sometimes if I needed some pressure-sensitive, you know, work. But I was never very good at, like, making con- translating what's down here to up what's up on my screen. Yeah, that, right? that's an issue, yeah. Uh, so I kind of struggled through that. But la- uh, last year, I got my iPad Pro and the mm-hmm. Pencil. And it it changed my game. I used to be very staunchly um, about um, doing a lot of my textures and all my textures and line work using physical media and ink. And I'm getting much more comfortable um, in some cases, like with my GQ France uh, uh, work that I do with them. They're a regular client. I do probably 90% of that all digital, the line work, everything. And and um, that's because of the pencil and iPad. And I use AstroPad. Yeah. Yeah, and, directly uh, with Photoshop, right? Yeah, and then yeah. Um, again, my sketches used to be on paper, and uh, I use exclusively Procreate now, just mm-hmm. just because it's uh, it's perfect the way you can. It's not perfect. There's definitely things I think that could improve yeah. about it, but um, it for for just creating a sketch that I don't need to scan in, and I can do it over yeah. and over and over and over again, uh, and create a stack and just organize them that way. I, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays the tools are like, you know, it's comparing with, I don't know, comparing to five years ago. It's just massive. It's a massive difference, and are going to get better and better all the time. Yeah, yeah. No. So that's so that's it. Like Procreate, or so you have your iPad, and then uh, you you, um, as far as we know, out like we who aren't in the shadows, as far as we know, you're doing most <laughs> of your work with Illustrator. Yeah, right. no, I, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. I use, and I would like to. Um, um, yeah, I have a lot of faith into the uh, into tablets, but I'm not sure Apple are the 
uh, cool they uh, used to be to mm-hmm. like you know push everything forward yeah and um, yeah right now it's a, you know it, it's just kind of that time where I don't know it's just uh, some some time has to pass until we we see something but yeah. definitely it's so convenient I remember when I when I started traveling also I I still was using Photoshop and I had a Cintiq um, uh, uh, 13 HD yeah which is which portable but you have a lot of wires and stuff and then on top of that I had my physical notebook and obviously I was filling them yeah <laughs> quickly. yeah plus the computer mailing and them home when I was just sorry were you mailing your notebooks home when you filled them uh, no not really because uh, <laughs> I was moving all the time and I, I didn't want to risk them because that, that was I don't know seven or eight months of work and yeah. there are many ideas and yeah I, 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 I keep them but and then I, I was going to cafes to work and it was impossible. I needed mm-hmm. two sockets. I needed a big table. I needed many things there mm-hmm. that, I don't know, compared to, to now that I, if I need to sketch, I just grab the iPad and the pencil and that's all. Or if I, I, I can work from airplanes, I can work from anywhere mm-hmm. uh, with the trackpad even. I don't even use a mouse, uh, mouse anymore with Illustrator. So it's just freedom. And mm-hmm. I don't start. Uh, piles of papers uh, everything is uh uh scannable i can just find it, everything i want in just seconds yeah and it it suits ve- me very well the uh working process and my way my the way i interact with digital tools is it, really really convenient for me hmm. okay so i want to now okay, i think we're fully into the the sort of digital nomad territory now. So, and it's, yeah. we're already 45 minutes in. Uh, uh, we might go a little over time. Is that okay with you? Or Yeah, sure. Yeah, oh, definitely. We just, can spend as much time as you want. Okay, don't, don't uh, encourage me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so I love the word digital nomad, but you want to unpack that for um, people? Yeah, it's a concept that started like, I don't know, five years, eight years ago, something like that, in terms of like people doing it, mm-hmm. uh, basically means uh, someone who uh, makes a living uh, with a digital tool, let's say a computer mm-hmm. uh, and the internet con- and an internet connection, and then basically moves freely, has mm-hmm. no uh, a permanent residence, has no home, there is no place called home. So yeah, digital nomads travel from place to another without any <laughs> any more like constraint. That that's the definition. Okay, and um, so I think I think we all know what the advantages are of being a digital nomad. You get to travel, mm-hmm. see the world, yeah. um, make money at the same time, and it, there's a lot of obvious glamour and romance in that. But what are the dark sides of of being Mm. a digital nomad? What are the challenges? First of all, I think uh, legally the world is not very well prepared for that because there doesn't exist something like, uh, I don't know, an international freelancer. That doesn't exist. Okay. Then there is this thing that most countries have that you need to be at least, I think it's four months to be considered a resident. Yeah, but the thing is, what if you are not even one month in a certain country? Right. Then there is kind of like a void in laws there, and it very obviously depends on each country. But this is not very well prepared. And also, if you know, if you want to keep being self-employed in your original country or con- country of origin, you you are still paying taxes. You are still paying for like healthcare. Well, in case you are in Europe or in in other countries yeah and you are not getting anything from that because you're just not basically not there if something happens you need to deal with with uh, travel insurances with right. with many other things. so the first thing is that it's it's a bit tricky right now because it, it's kind of like you need to hack the system you need to find like workarounds to, yeah. to make easy things you need to find an accountant that you can work with yeah. Uh, in the distance, they need to have some special per- permissions uh, uh, from you in case there is something that certificates or stuff like that that you need. Mm-hmm. And this is one thing. Uh, but the other also is to um, 
basically to be it really if, if being a just a regular freelancer uh, requires a lot of uh, uh, responsibility being like very serious about it knowing mm -hmm. that you need to uh you can't or or you shouldn't work with wearing pajamas uh that you need to you know have a time all this yeah this is multiplied by five or ten so when, the amount of when you are traveling so you're yeah. you, the requirement for self-discipline yeah is, that's is, is that's higher important. being a traveling freelancer yeah than just very being... very high right yeah especially because obviously when you're a digital nomad you you can choose wherever you want to go yeah and some obviously you choose good places that are appealing for you that you want to explore or that they are so amazing or they are like in the paradise and being in that context and having to work and having to have you know this task list for the day at the same time as you are there, it's 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 very tricky because okay. it's so easy to, to that your brain tricks you saying, you know, just for go out and then at the end of the day you can finish that and this never works. A good advice is to just do what you have to do first and then just go and enjoy. It. But this is a very tricky thing. And then there are yeah. other tricky things like. Uh, things that I've missed a lot, like cooking or or having your own uh, routines. For example, I like having routines. I like waking up and uh, going to sleep at certain times. I like, uh, you know, having being in control of my life. When traveling, also <laughs> is tricky. You right. don't have a kitchen. You don't have a, I don't know. You you can't go to the gym, or you, it's super difficult if you, you need to sign up for gyms all the time and yeah. move and. So it's a challenge on those terms. Like it, 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 it tests your self-discipline. All right. So guys, I'm going to have to cut off the conversation there and leave you hanging until part two launches next week. Thanks, Magos, for an amazing conversation. It's really great just to introduce you in this first part and dip our toes in the pool of the digital nomad life and what it means to illustrate work and travel at the same time. So thanks, Magos. Really appreciate it. If you guys want to check out more of Magos' work, his website is magos.is. And of course, he has Instagram and a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm going to keep all the links in the notes below. Of course, be sure to also check out Magos' illustration.tools. And again, link is below. If you guys like this video, please hit that like button. If you're liking the videos that I'm producing here, please subscribe. Every subscription, every like is an encouragement to me to keep on doing this. It lets me know that I'm doing something that's valuable to other people and, not, and that it's worthwhile. If you guys have questions, please ask me in the comments. And as you know, the questions you ask are the main drivers of content for this vidcast. And I really love to hear what you guys are asking and I'm eager to share whatever I have learned in my own journey. So I'm going to leave you guys there. Until next week, keep making great stuff and keep asking great questions.